well as the others. He discovered America down in Miami. Back, back when Miami was a beautiful city. And he gravitated north and went to high school in Melbourne. Now Joyce Bethay would probably think that she would have known him when she was there, but he was ahead of her a little bit. And some good things happened to him while he was at Melbourne. He joined the Key Club. Not only did he join the Key Club, he became the international Key Club, Club president. There were some good things happened to him. He was in Europe. He was in Radio Free Europe. He was broadcast into Soviet homes, plugging for America. When he completed his time there, he went to Yale. I don't know if he had any help on the SAT or not, but he probably did. When he finished Yale, he went to law school in Virginia, got his law degree, and it wasn't long until he was ready for the political race. Let me tell you something that's a real jewel. When he was at Melbourne High School, they gave him an office of a secretary to do the work that he had to do when he was international president. Now, he started politics in high school. <laughs> in the House of Representatives, he was treasurer, insurance commission, then he ran for the Senate, two terms, and I want to call to your attention, those of you that have to get a program. Today is my program responsibility. Now this is the type of program I expect. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to have the visitors, the regular individuals. Glad you came. We hope that uh, you have enough to eat. So may I in extend to you an invitation to hear an out outstanding speaker. I have heard him at, at the uh, international conventions, at the district conventions. My wife claims that he has spoken to her Delta Kappa Gamma many times. She wants to, you know, get ahead of everybody. <laughs> Her program date is coming up soon, and she's trying to get that young married couple out of England. <laughs> Senator Nelson, Nelson, it's a pleasure to have you. Well, George, thank you. You obviously did your homework, and I have no idea that anybody would remember going back to the key club um, that was uh, along with being involved as the state president of the florida 4-h clubs uh, key club was one of the things that really taught me a lot about public service and of course, the Key Club uh, was all about, uh, for back then it was high school boys, now it's high school boys and girls, and it was all about community service. And so, uh, thanks to the Kiwanis Clubs, you all gave me that early training, and also that love of public service that I got exactly from the Key Club. Uh, and uh, when I came home from the Army and started my law practice, uh, I went out to my high school, and the Key Club has, had disbanded. It was during the middle of Vietnam, 
And of course there were a lot of strife on all the campuses, not only the college campuses, but the high school campuses as well. And so I went to the school administration and said, do you mind if I start the key club up? I had joined the Melbourne Kiwanis Club. And uh, I had more fun getting those boys then, not just boys and girls. It, it was boys back then. And we got them so worked up, and I'm telling you this story for a reason, because they became the premier service organization in the whole city of Melbourne. And so it came around uh, a few months later to their state convention, and it was in Jacksonville. So I went down to the Volkswagen dealer, and I got a, him to lend me the Volkswagen bus. And so I took all my key club boys to Jacksonville, and at the last minute, they had a, a cancellation for their banquet speaker, and they found out I was coming. So they asked me to do that. So I called up my former college roommate, Bruce Smathers, and I said, Bruce, I'm coming in to Jacksonville. They've asked me to be the speaker. I've got a date flying in. Why don't you get a date and come down there and let me give the speech, and then we'll all go out on the town. Bruce brought as his date, Grace Cabot, <laughs> who then he introduced and insisted that after that weekend that I take Grace out. And that was over 40 years ago, and Grace and I are going to celebrate our 40th anniversary. <laughs> and just to tell you the completion of that story, I was able to return the favor for Bruce. I introduced him on a blind date to Susan Gamble. Susan is Susan Smathers, and their son, Bruce, is my godson. Oh, wow. So you see what the key club did for me? <laughs> I have looked so forward to this today because Tommy Tart and I are going to give you a report on Captain Colin Kelly. And I want first to acknowledge, uh, you all know Lynn Bannister, who uh, represents me in Madison County. Uh, she's in our Tallahassee office. Stand up back there, Lynn. And Clint Odom is our commerce specialist. Stand up, Clint. Uh, Clint is in our Tommy and I have looked forward to this, and I'm going to introduce Tommy in a minute so that you know what his connection is here. We have looked forward to this uh, because we have done a, a great deal of research on Captain Kelly. Uh, ever since I've been a little boy, uh, going over to see my family, and my family goes back 182 years, they uh, first came uh, here and settled in the Orange Hill area, which is six miles south of uh, Chipley. And so as a little boy, there wasn't an Interstate 10, uh, we'd come through Madison all the time, and I would see that beautiful monument down there in the town square, the one with the winged angels. And so I had always wanted to know about Captain Cole and Kelly. And, of course, I had been told about him, uh, that he had done these extraordinary things only a day after the Pearl Harbor attack. And literally, because of the international dateline, it was the day after, but in reality, it was within the first 24-hour period when the Japanese had attacked our forces in uh, the Philippines. And Captain Kelly, Tommy will tell you about the specifics 
of how he had positioned himself uh, before the first round of bombing by the Japanese Zeros. Uh, gotten the B-17s out of there, only three of them had survived. Came back, landed on this bomb cratered airfield at Clark Field. Took on the bombs as fast as he could. With his crew, took off searching for the Japanese aircraft carrier. And now this is after, just within a 24 hour period, after we had had the surprise attack. And you remember the surprise attack that for years leading up to it, President Roosevelt, facing a nation that was really trying to stay out of war that was raging in Europe with Hitler rampaging all over Europe, had gone through the legislative fictions of the Lynn Lease Act in order to get equipment to Britain so that the United Kingdom could hold off Hitler. And then, of course, uh, in America's isolationist attitude at the time, of course, that changed the very minute that they heard that we had been savagely attacked by the Pacific forces of the Japanese fleet. Colin Kelly, getting ready for that attack, had seen it. Tommy's going to describe to you one of those scenes as he had flown over the island of Formosa and had seen all the Japanese planes down there amassed and tried to get his commanders to get ready. He got his plane and two others out and the first bombing occurred. And so as he landed on the field midst the bomb craters took on the bombs and went out searching for the Japanese carrier and saw what they thought was the carrier. He had only three bombs. <clears throat> Tommy will describe to you the bombing run that he made. All three bombs hit, but the middle bomb hit directly in the middle of the ship and it started to sink. Uh, the Japanese commander, since they were close in at shore, ran it up close to shore so he could run it aground so that it wouldn't sink, but it was out of commission. And then as Captain Kelly took his B-17 and his crew back to land at Clark Field, he was already in contact with the radio tower, he was already within sight. The Zeros jumped him, and they shot it up, killed his tail gunner, set the plane on fire and realizing that it was hopeless to get the plane down, he ordered his crew to bail out and he held that B-17 steady thinking he might get it in. And then it exploded just before he, about a few miles from Clark Field. Now that's a hero. And because of that, I wanted to see what was the recognition that he had gotten since this was 70 years ago. And what I found was that he got the very highest award underneath the Medal of Honor, the Distinguished Flying Cross. So I asked the Department of the Army, which has the responsibility for the Department of Defense on all of the metal decorations to reopen the case. They first told me that they couldn't reopen it because someone else earlier this decade had asked it to be reopened and they had reviewed it and had said that the Distinguished Flying Cross uh, was in fact the appropriate metal. Uh, I ask the Secretary, on the basis of newfound information, uh, namely the affidavit 
that Tommy had acquired from two of the crew members. One of those crew members' niece is here, and she is Gladney Cherry. And Gladney, will you stand up and be recognized? And I want to tell about your uncle. Uh, her uncle, Sergeant Bob Altman, uh, was one of the crew members and was ordered by Captain Kelly to bail out. And of course, Bob Altman, uh, who just recently passed away, but before, he was so clear about how much he admired Colin Kelly that he was the true hero that kept that ship stable so his crew could bail out and then paid for it with his life after he had sunk the first Japanese ship after the attack of Pearl Harbor. Uh, I am very honored that the family that still lives here, uh, that are relatives of Captain Kelly, Vicki and Colin Howerton are here with us today. Would you all stand up and be recognized? And the Colin uh, comes exactly from uh, Colin Kelly, and you might be surprised to know that General Colin Powell is named Colin after Colin Kelly. So it is a name that has gone down in history, and as I get ready to introduce you to Tom Tart. Uh, since the Army reviewed it not once, but three times. And they found that the five other instances that were almost identical fact situations of commanders of their aircraft going down with the aircraft in World War II as a result of the heroism of them keeping that and saving their crew, but that the facts of this circumstance were much closer to, even though it was the first one and the first ship that was sunk right after the attack, uh, they felt like that the fact situation was closer to the 250 other instances in which the facts were similar to Captain Kelly's. And therefore, uh, they denied the Medal of Honor, but pointed out that the Distinguished Flying Cross, which had been given to those commanders of those 250 other airplanes, almost identical fact circumstances. I have the letter from the Secretary of the Army who did the review, I talked to him personally on several occasions. He took it up to a senior review board of admirals and generals, and so I feel that they did the adequate uh, research to make the proper decision. We know he is our Medal of Honor winner. And he is a true hero, not only of Madison and of Florida, but also of these United States. And because of that, what I have done is introduce a resolution in the Senate. Uh, and when we pass it, I will send you all a copy. But for the family, I wanted you to have the copy of the Senate resolution that honors uh, Captain Kelly and the heroism. It recites Bob Altman and another crew member, Hal Yard, who is in Seattle, that Tommy was able to get his affidavit. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been an extraordinary uh, lesson of American history of which we can all be proud 
at a time when we need heroes. And right here in our midst, we really have a hero. So, as I introduce Tom Tart, who was in my wedding 40 years ago. And by the way, I'm still waiting to be in his wedding. And he's still a bachelor. Tommy brought his two brothers from Valdosta. Tommy was the premier state high school quarterback from Valdosta High School, left and went to play football for Ray Graves, at the University of Florida, blew out his knee, and Ray Graves kept him in his scholarship all those four years as the student recruiter for the Gators. Years later, as Tommy and I are young lawyers and getting together then as bachelors, and then soon thereafter, Tommy is a groomsman in my wedding, and after he has retired as the general counsel for Orlando Utilities Company, uh, he is a self-trained historian with an expertise in the Civil War and in World War II. Tommy's the one that got me started on Colin Kelly and took me to Gainesville to interview uh, Bob Altman one of the crew members, uh, uh, Ms. Cherry's uncle, that bailed out of the plane. And then when I heard that story, I knew I had to pursue this. So as I asked Tommy to come up and share with us the specifics of this heroic act that was not just once but several, let me present to uh, the family, both Ms. Cherry as well as Colin's family, the Senate resolution that I have introduced. And if I could just give that, if you would just pass it down to them, I would appreciate it. So Tommy, come on up. And everybody, this is Thomas Brogdon Tart from Valdosta, Georgia. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Bill and I have uh, done a lot of things in Florida. He's been involved in politics, and I've been the lawyer for the power company in Orlando. And because of that, I've been able to travel to 32 cities that are in the association of cities like Tallahassee and Key West and Jacksonville. And as I've traveled the state of Florida the last 30 years, I learned so much more about the great state. David, Tim, and I were born in Jacksonville, fifth generation Floridians. Bill Nelson's great-great-grandmother was a homesteader on the Cana Canaveral Peninsula, which you know today is the Cape Canaveral uh, runway for the shuttle landing. And we went there a few years ago with the park ranger and went to his family's homestead. And they were so poor that she had to raise broom grass to cut it and take it to Titusville to make brooms. But we saw the broom grass fields and... Uh, We've been a long ways. We went to a little field in the country outside of Choknahatchee Bay. Because of my great interest, I knew about that field because it was the secret airfield that Jimmy Doolittle trained on to take the Doolittle Raiders to Tokyo and four other cities. And because of his influence with the military, for the first time, we've now recognized where those hundred warriors trained to give their life to strike back. And we put a marker there. It touches me because we had one of the new little raiders with us. And he told us in a little trailer about what they did. They knew they weren't coming back. They took off from the Hornet that day 220 miles earlier because they'd been spotted by a Japanese boat. And they knew when they dropped their bombs over Kobe, over Yokohama, over Tokyo, there was no way in heck. They were going to get to a base in China. <clears throat> you know, my brother, the minister from Park Avenue Methodist Church, will tell you he believes in miracles. We were told a miracle happened. The winds come off the Gulf of Japan, across Japan, west to east. But that day, the wind changed. And those 16 planes, 15 of them made the coast of China. And of the 80 men who flew those five passenger 16 planes, 
68 Savannah. Now that was the first offensive strike by the United States in the Tokyo Raid, and we did the mark of it. We're here today to honor a hero before that, the first hero of the war. And if you read the uh, newspapers in New York and Los Angeles, it was Colin Kelly who they chose as a hero because of what Bill told you just did. Now what I'm going to do is 21 till 1. I'm going to show you 10 pictures leading up to and including the picture of the handsome Colin Kelly. And then, in our research for the Medal of Honor, we, uh, we found the archive in a little library in New York City, narrated by none other than Frank Sinatra, and who does he interview? Colin Kelly, Bombardier, Sergeant Levin, who was with Bob Altman and the crew that day. Sergeant Levin dies later, not in the parachute, but later on. But we've got Frank Sinatra's interview, and we're going to end with that. So if we can, we'll do the 10 pictures, and then I'm going to give you the two-minute interview with Sergeant Levin. And when you hear, and you've got to remember what Bill told you, when you hear what the sergeant said after flying 50 missions about this mission, and then plug in the facts, there's no question Colin Kelly is one of America's greatest. He went down with the ship. So we go with B? That's B. B. Logan's my computer expert. He's going to help me today because uh, I went to the University of Florida to play football. <laughs> that reminds me. Bill told you about his, everybody knows about his key club and the quiet club. He didn't tell you he was a quarterback for Melbourne High School. Because he's bow he was real fast. <laughs> he lettered Bill Nelson. I want y'all to know something. How many football fans we got in the ring? <laughs> Bill Nelson lettered twice on the Melbourne High School football team. I read this in Andy. The first letter he got was from the coach telling him not to come back to see him. <laughs> and the second letter that the little bow-legged quarterback got was from the coach telling him to bring the equipment he's stolen back. <laughs> so he lettered twice. Let's get that straight. originally about Florida heroes, and Colin Kelly was my first hero. But I want to mention up in the upper left corner, Jimmy Doolittle, because that, that was one of Bill and I's first trips to celebrate what he did over there in Eglin Airfield, right here. Also, those of you that know Tallahassee, know where the community college is there, what you don't know is the Tuskegee Airmen from near Auburn, Alabama. Tuskegee Airmen train in that hill. Now hear why we went to war. I have spent billions in the last five years, and the German people now must know what the purpose of that was. I told my friend Bear Gehring, create an air force which will protect Germany against any force and any attack in the world. Now what he just said was, he wanted to protect Germany against anyone coming to invade them. All the eyes of the world were on Germany. No one in this part of the world thought that the war would start with Pearl Harbor. We weren't prepared, but Colin Kelly was prepared. And I'm going to tell you why, on four different occasions, what he did to become one of my favorite heroes. But what you just heard is him saying that they wanted to be protected, which was propaganda. But here is the first real hero of the war, 